This is an actual quote. I'm not going to confess who said it. I walked in and they made me eat this ice cream. It's true. And as soon as I heard that, my brain immediately said, Flip Wilson, the devil made me buy that dress. Flip Wilson's a comedian. And that was part of one of his routines. And okay, this one's a gray hair thing. Sorry, if you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're not gray haired, you might not have a clue as to who Flip Wilson was. He was a comedian and he had this one routine. And when I was a little kid, I thought it was hilarious because he was saying the truth. The devil made me buy the dress. The devil made me do it. And in this case, the person was saying, it was my fault. They made me eat the ice cream. And there is and there isn't a truth to that. Um, those might have actually been the words I said that, well, we've got this ice cream. You got to help eat it. So, okay. But sometimes we need to think, one, about the words we're using, two, about the words we're hearing. Because we can read something and get good and comfortable, just like eating a bowl of ice cream can be really good and comfortable and not think about what's really going on. And a story, story, a passage we're all familiar with, Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because they heard them speak in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, one another Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we each hear each in our own tongue in which we were born? We get that part, sort of. We hear that, okay, a miracle was occurring. They came out, and all of a sudden you've got these men that are all speaking these different languages. Languages that were represented not by who had just traveled in because this was a Jewish holiday. And they came to celebrate it. But even those who were there hadn't necessarily been born there. They'd been born in different areas of the Roman Empire. And because they wanted to be closer to the temple, they had moved back to Jerusalem, back to be close to where God was. And we get, okay, and this is a weird picture. It's still the same picture. It's just been twisted a bit. We get the goodness of being near God because, hey, if you've got a belief, you've got a faith, at that time, the way to get closer to God physically was to move to Jerusalem. These were the people who chose to get closer to God, either because they had moved to Jerusalem or because of the holiday, they had come to Jerusalem to celebrate God. They made the choice. They saw God as the good and they wanted the good. Sort of like ice cream. You like it, it's good, and you want it, cool. Jumping down to the second part of 11. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? This is one of the points we tend to miss. We tend to shorten Acts chapter 2 down to just Acts chapter 2. It was more than that. They heard about the amazing works of God. Peter and the others were getting up and telling them what had been happening over the past three years. It wasn't just this short paragraph. It was a lot more. They spoke and they spoke and they spoke. And what did they talk about? They could have talked about what had just happened. Flaming tongues came down upon them and they spoke in tongues. And for those of you that missed that one, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, they walked into the fire and they were able to walk out of the fire unharmed. So that's yet another one of those. If you want to map things onto the Old Testament, flaming tongues, we've got fire in the Old Testament. God's people got fed with manna. Jesus fed them with fishes and loaves. 
We have one example, at least in the Old Testament, where the young child is raised from the dead. Jesus, we have at least, specifically, three instances in the New Testament that are accounted for when he raised the dead. And as John tells us, if we'd written about everything, you couldn't have fit it all into one book. It would take up way too much. Don't sell short to the New Testament and just say, well, there's just this little bit. There's so much that wasn't recorded. And even with this instance, there was so much more that was said. And they could hear. Why could they hear? Because they knew the Old Testament. They knew what the signs should have looked like. It should have looked like what they already knew. So that they could recognize where were those signs coming from. If you got people being fed, if you got people being healed, if you've got flame coming down in miraculous ways, in one case, didn't destroy everybody. In one case, destroys the stones, destroys it all. Who's got the power of the fire from on high? God does. What is this? This is a God thing they're saying. Why did they come? They came because they wanted to be close to God. <clears throat> In short, this was an opportunity for those who had ears to hear, hearts to hear. A message was being presented they could hear. <clears throat> Excuse me. 14 through 16, or 14 and 16. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Not just hear it, act on it. <clears throat> Verse 16, but this is what he spoke by the prophet Joel. All right. Not only has he given them that reason to be listening, he's now giving them a reason to be willing to act on it. Because I'm not just coming here to tell you what's gone on recently. I'm here to tell you something about what's gone on recently that was foretold. The prophet Joel said, God has already spoken. Open your ears to God. Peter and the others were no longer speaking from their own authority. Actually, they weren't speaking from their own authority to begin with, but they're letting them know, hey, not only does this sound awesome, but God, are you listening? And are you willing to heed? Because if you're not willing to act on God, why are you here? He doesn't ask that. It's an implied question. Because why are you coming? Well, it's a festival. Woohoo! It's ice cream. It's delicious. Why should they have been coming? More than what I can get out of it for myself. And we're going to hit on that in a bit. <clears throat> because, yeah, the image does start to get cloudy if you're focusing on the wrong thing. If you're focusing on the celebration, if you're focusing on getting together with others who are celebrating the same thing, then it's sort of like what happened yesterday all over this nation. Getting together for yay! Pick your team and yell. Because the truth is, how much do you have in common when you're at one of those games with the person who's standing next to you? You're yelling for the same team or you're yelling for opposite teams. But what really is in common between the two of you? Usually next to nothing. If they were coming for the celebration only, what do they have in common with the person next to them? Possibly nothing at all. If they weren't willing to heed God, that should have been the number one thing in common that they had with the person that would be next to them there celebrating. Continuing with 17 and 18. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. 
And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. In the last days, the Old Testament shut down. Why? Because God's people weren't being God's people. There's going to come a time when something's going to be different in the last days. And the last days will look like manna from heaven, fire from on high, God's children becoming victorious. We know what the signs should look like. And when they heard the similar, they should have had reason to respond. 20. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before. And I'm coming back to that word. The coming in the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They knew what had happened. What happened 30 plus years prior to this day? Herod came through and killed all the young boys blood before the coming of the great day it's going to be nasty and where's the nasty coming from it's coming from on high not god on high but the powers and the authorities of this world the lesser authorities and when they heard <coughs> excuse me sun and moon that was for them one of those worldly power levels because the sun and the moon, they're just objects. They're not the God level, but they're higher than what we can reach. And most governments saw themselves at the God level, higher than we can reach. But the truth was, and the Jews knew it, those weren't the real powers. And those real powers brought down blood upon the people. And unfortunately, we can treat this like an ice cream moment. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they were the wrong. They brought down the blood. Except, why did God go silent with the Old Testament? Was it because of the Romans? Was it because of the other nations that weren't following God? Or was it because God's own people hadn't been following God? That God said, I've had enough. I'm leaving the temple. They had a reason to hear there will be blood. And they knew there had been. But greater than that was the reason. You know why God left. Do you want him coming back? Take heed, be willing to ask. I mean, to act and we need to hold on to why should they have heard because I'm going to come back to it in a very non ice cream very uncomfortable way 22 men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth a man attested by God to you by miracles wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you've taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death convicting now wait some of those people had just traveled there they weren't the crowd that had said crucify him they just showed up recently to celebrate God kind of things this wasn't on us. Where did I point to the sin? Before. When did the blood come? Before. Why had God left? Before. The sin was already present. And sometimes we miss this. I'm holding off a bit still farther on this holding off. Jumping down to 31, he foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh seek corruption. 
this God, I'm sorry, this Jesus, God is raised up of which we are all witness. So here's another point that we tend to miss. Think about all the physical things they could recognize. Somebody being raised from the dead can see that. Somebody who rose from the dead in a way we don't do today even. You don't have the hole in the side all the way to the heart. That was a bigger kind of resurrection rather than just CPR, rather than just all the things we do medically today to bring a body back to life. Jesus came alive in a way you can't do. So that, so that we could believe the little bit that Peter just tossed in that his soul was not left in Hades. Can we see somebody's soul? Nope. Can we know where that soul went to? Nope. When you can see the resurrected Christ for 40 days walking the earth, when you know he was resurrected with a power greater than life itself, because if it only was life, he's dead again, right off the bat, because the hole wasn't fixed. When you can see and believe what happens right before your eyes, you can also see and believe that when I tell you his soul is not left in Hades, you can believe that even though you've got no basis for understanding that. Just like when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Take up your mat and walk. How could they believe in sins being forgiven except for the fact that the man who'd been lame since birth stood up and walked? And because they saw, they could believe what they couldn't see. A physical truth was given to show why a spiritual truth could be believed. But now I'm going to take and turn this in the wrong direction. Because I left out a passage somehow in my editing. When it talks about they need to save themselves from this perverse generation. Wait a second, I thought that the bad was before. No, the bad was right then too. And sometimes we get too comfortable with the ice cream. It's not so bad, it's dairy products, it's nutritious. It's got eggs in it. I'm down with eggs. I'm down with dairy. That's healthy. Except, well, we live in one of the greatest nations in the world. Let's talk about how great it is. Who's the worst leaders we can think of that did the most violent kinds of death? Hitler. Yeah, he's bad. And you got Pol Pot. He wiped out a lot of his own people. Saddam Hussein. Oh, yeah. We could go back through in the past hundred years, name off all the worst leaders there were, the most violent, disgusting, killing, etc. And we could add on top of that number all the people we killed fighting those people. And it won't measure up to the number of abortions that have occurred in the past 50 years. And guess what? Those abortions weren't all because of rape. We have allowed to be killed more unborn children than all of the wars. And that's just here in the US. Oh, but abortion, that's not a decided issue yet. So, all right, let's set that one aside. And okay, on this next one, we're not the worst. Only one in three girls in the United States has been abused sexually. There's a nation, and I'm not going to name them, where it's over 90% of girls under the age of 13. And it's been by family members in that nation. Yeah, one in three is heinous enough. I'm sorry, that's not a good place to be standing. Let's talk about how we treat those with mental issues. Okay, turn on the news and watch some of the political that's going on. I'm disgusted with what we consider acceptable. When Hillary Clinton, and I'm a Republican, 
fell the second time. I'm sorry. You don't push somebody who's already dealing with some mental issues. And I'm not talking about crazy. I'm talking about her brain was having problems to the point she couldn't consistently stand. Rather than showing compassion and getting her the medical help she needed, they pushed her. Both sides pushed her. It's not just Hillary. Look at our president. I'm sorry. There are too many signs that he's been pushed beyond where he should be. And we're going to ride that one down, whether you're on the Republican side or the Democrat side. We don't treat mental health the right way. We leave them out on the streets or we incarcerate them because we don't care enough. We shouldn't feel good and comfortable with where we're sitting today, just like they shouldn't have felt good and comfortable with where they were sitting as far as what was allowed in the society. 36, therefore let the house of Israel know that assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted, not because they were the ones saying crucify him necessarily. They knew they were part of the generation that had. They knew that as comfortable as they might have been about themselves, this is too great a wrong to allow to go down quietly. And they knew that something different had to start happening. Do you want to be counted with the world? Or is that the seat you don't want to be in? They were saying we don't want to be counted with those who were saying crucify him. And for those that actually had been part of that, we so don't want to be what you're pointing out because you're right. We were part of that wrong. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord shall call. And verse 40. And with this and many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Yes, the blood had occurred 30 plus years before. Yes, it was their ancestors who had done the wrong that caused God to say, I am sick and I am out of here. And no, God wasn't happy with that kind of response, but he wasn't happy with what they had gotten comfortable with. And the people that were living that day needed to not be comfortable with where the world was, even if they weren't the ones yelling, crucify him. Today, we need to make sure, one, we're not comfortable with where we're sitting in the United States, even though it might be the best place to be because it's still messed up. We need to be uncomfortable unless we're saying, I want to be counted differently. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 11, jumping back. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. There was a contrast. There was a choice. There was what God had done in the past in reaching out, what God had just done and was reaching out. And what Peter was saying, God has done for who? For you. Why? Because he wants it to be different. Recognize there is what the world offers and they're going to make it look good. But just because it looks good doesn't necessarily mean it's right. There's the real good and there's the feel good. When they could hear, truth is they were still in the feel good. God wants it good for us. Yay me! You need to change. I could become better. Yay me. 
repent. I become better. Guess what? First three things are still all for me. It's still the soft ice cream. What about God becoming the authority in your life? What about taking him on completely in baptism? Oops. It's no longer about me now. It's about God. And I'm saying it the way I'm saying it. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And woohoo! We look at that and say, look at how many people responded. It was 3,000. Whoa, there was a qualifier and that qualifier is there for a reason. Those who chose to heed. Doesn't say everybody that was there heard, heed, and responded. Those who chose to receive, acted. A lot of times we put it down as though it was a huge number. Not for that holiday it wasn't. There were those who heard, those who were convicted. Yeah, this is a terrible world. But when it came time to choose the hard, to choose for God, to act for God, I was good with the soft cell ice cream. But you're asking a bit much when you're asking me to step out for God because I was good with this part you're telling me about myself. Because when I repent, huh, I just became better because I'm no longer the bad. Are you willing to act for God? I repented, isn't that enough? It's sort of like the sinner's prayer. I felt guilty. I'm gonna talk about how I wanna. Are you willing to act all the way for God? Or are you too busy sitting comfortable with the ice cream? There's a lot who heard, who felt they were heeding because they felt guilty, but did not receive because they did not act. Be saved from this perverse generation. They knew what had happened. They knew what was happening right then. And they knew they couldn't be satisfied with the status quo. I don't want to be numbered among. What it said inside the bulletin this morning is sometimes we have an event in life that's so overwhelming it blows us away. And sometimes we allow ourselves to be blown away because we don't want to face the truth about what we're facing. Do we want to be counted in the world or do we want to be counted with God? Being counted with God means more than just feeling guilty. It means repenting, changing. It means more than that. Because there were a lot of people who could have felt guilty and could have repented, but weren't willing to act the way God asked. And as many as receive were baptized. Doesn't talk about those who receive for forgiveness of sins who weren't baptized. Doesn't talk about those who would receive salvation and weren't baptized because the truth is if you're not willing to act for God, you don't get it. And I mean that both ways. And all right, this is a two part sermon because next week we're covering what comes next. Because the truth is, those last two points weren't two points that stand on their own. 242. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. Continued steadfastly. Acts chapter 2 isn't about what happened one moment in time. It's about an ongoing, 
because it either went all the way through changing completely baptism or it was a quick dunk you got wet and it did you nothing we're called in Christ to choose to turn to become to continue or we're doing something other than what God has asked of us. If you need to take on Christ in baptism or you need the prayers of the church, welcome to come as we stand and sing.